All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to our GSMI New York City webinar on the grad school application process. Uh, we have three great speakers from the Scientific Latino team. Uh, before we proceed, I just want to let you know that we're going to break up this talk into different sections. So feel free to hold uh, your questions towards the end of each section. You're more than welcome to add a question in the Q&A session that we have in the webinar. You could also use the chat version, but I strongly prefer using the Q&A so all the questions are compiled. Uh, and obviously, we're going to have questions uh, at the end of uh, this webinar um, that we'll answer to the best of our abilities. All righty. Uh, so, uh, Daisy, you can get uh, let us get started. Awesome. OK, yeah. So hi, guys. My name is Daisy. Um, I am a fourth year PhD student studying milk and biophysics and biochemistry at Yale. Um, I graduated in December 2018 from Johns Hopkins. I majored in biophysics and applied math and stats. Um, you know, science as with experiments, right? But, you know, I feel like a lot of um, people's like, journeys like, in science is not always linear, right? And so I actually started off studying evolutionary biology um, in 2012. And then that's when I was studying like C. elegans. I was studying like I was collecting worm samples from all the boroughs in New York City. And I was just looking at under like a microscope, right? And so that's when I began to really love um, research, but then I quickly switched into uh, biophysics. Um, I think, yeah, a year after. Um, so in college, I took three summer research internships. Um, I did take the GRE once. I, I believe that the time when I was applying, the GREs was still a thing. But then the year after the, the start of the whole Grexit movement, which um, Annabelle will actually discuss like later. Um, and yeah, so I had seven invitations for PhD interviews. I declined two and then um, gone to, I guess, five. Okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Anival. Uh, so I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. I joined before joining Ann Arbor, the PhD program, I was a prep student at Case Western Reserve. And uh, before that, I was part of, I was at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, uh, where I did my major in integrative biology. And I was fortunate enough to be able to have three summers of research and be a Rice Scholar before I applied to grad school my first time. So I had to apply to grad school twice. Um, the first time I applied from undergrad and I got rejected by 10 programs without any interviews. Um, however, after I did my prep program that year, 2019 to 2020, I applied again and I actually got accepted into all the 10 programs that had rejected me the year before. So that was a poetic ending to that story and um, we'll chat a little bit more about that. So I took the GRE twice, um, we'll chat out, we'll talk a more about that and uh, However, I boycotted it and I did not submit it to any of the 10 schools. So I applied the year, I believe, after Daisy. And so, yes, um, it's not required. It wasn't required and I got into all the programs. Um, suffice to say, I also took the TOEFL, which is another standardized test we'll be talking about. So it's great to have all of you here. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I introduce myself, I pretty much just uh, send a message over the chat. You know, feel free to mention where you're from. Uh, and where you're joining us from. Uh, uh, someone other than the panelists, feel free to, okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that it's uh, working now. All right, so my name is uh, Robert William Fernandez. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia University. Um, did my PhD uh, in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale. I went to a very small school in Jamaica, Queens in New York uh, called York College, part of the City University of New York. And before that, I went to community college. So I started my uh, research in biology, uh, then switched into biophysics. I did one summer internship at Princeton, uh, and I took the GRE once. I applied to 10 universities, uh, and I got six invitations for interviews. I declined a couple of them, and I was able to get four offers. All righty. I, I love seeing the chat very active. Great. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we'll get started with the rest of the webinar. I... Okay. Okay. So you guys are here to learn about, you know, applying to a PhD program in science. So it's important to know what is a PhD program in science, right? Um, so the, the STEM PhD 
the experience, right? So a PhD in STEM is free. So unlike other higher education degrees, like an MD, right? So from med school, an M, MA, MS, a JD, right? Uh, MBA, um, a PhD in, in STEM is free. So the university essentially pays for your tuition and you're given a certain stipend and, and health insurance, right? And so that stipend is also, it fluctuates depending on the school because it depends on the location, based on the real estate and how much, you know, it costs to like live in that particular area. Um, and so like, yeah, why, why pursue a PhD degree? Um, obviously you wanna obtain more research experience in your field of interest to build your future career, right? So you learn how to think like and be an independent scientist. Um, you develop critical planning and uh, execution and communication skills. A lot of uh, part, you know, people tend to think a PhD degree is just, you know, in, in the biosciences at least, right? It's just you in a lab, um, you know, pipetting all day or, you know, programming all day and you're just like by yourself, it's not, right? You're juggling so many other things. So in regards to like planning, right? You have to think ahead, um, you know, what instruments are available, things like that. Um, you have to mentor, you have to teach, right? And also communicating with your PI, people in your lab, and even others, like inside of your lab, outside of your lab, outside of your school. Um, and so with all these skills that you are gaining from your PhD, right, people tend to think that the only route that you're going to be taking, right, with a PhD is just an ac academia, but that's not true, right? Because you have so many valuable skills that you're gaining from a PhD and that makes you very, you know, um, attractive, so to speak, uh, and very suitable um, for many other career paths and just, just a few um, listed here. So biotech, consulting, um, science communication, right? Science policy, government, um, yeah, pharma, um, things like that. So the STEM PhD experience, like the timeline looks something like this, uh, roughly like this. So when you matriculate into PhD program, right? So in your first year, you're obviously not, you don't, you don't have a home lab, right? So during this period, right? Your first um, year in your PhD program, you're gonna be going through two, at least two rotations, right? Um, don't worry if you don't feel like, you know, after your third rotation that you feel, all right, I still am not vibing with you know other labs and it's okay to rotate in another lab right because it's important to feel comfortable right in a space with people and your pi that you know best aligns with who you are um and your research interests so you're going to be undergoing rotations where you get a feel of the lab right for six to eight weeks um also depending on the phd program um and or you also may directly join a lab right depending on the stem discipline so maybe let's say you're in physics right and so then you would directly be applying into the program because you've already identified the pi that you want to work with so in your first two years you're also going to be going through um you know a lot of coursework right and again every phd program has a different number of coursework requirements and also depending um, on where you matriculate into you might also like you know get into a training grant like a certificate program um so that also you know add on a few more courses um, but typically the first two years are just classes and, and research um and then sometime you know between years one or three you'll be going through something what's called a quali qualifying exam. So this is when you switch from being like a PhD student to like a PhD candidate. So this, I would say is like probably your first like big milestone in your, in your PhD. And the second milestone would essentially just be like your defense. <laughs> so candidacy, and then it's your defense. Um, yeah, and then your ex, which is just um, whenever you can fit in and whenever, you know, you feel like, best that you can incorporate some teaching um typically your first two years um just because in your later years you might be in the thick of things right you're so deep in your research and you're so busy doing all these things and so you kind of want to might want to knock it out right your first three years or so so TAing for maybe a semester or two um depending on the PhD program again and some PhD programs don't even require teaching requirements um yeah and then Basically, yeah, so it's exactly what I said. So after your your oral uh, or written examination for candidacy, then it's your research until you graduate. All right, so I just went over the some PhD experience. Next is, all right, so how to choose a PhD program. Um, okay, so, you know, when you're applying, you're preparing to apply for P, uh, PhD programs, right? Like obviously number one is like making a list of, 
the programs that you're interested in applying to, um, right? So master's versus PhD programs. Um, typically that has like, you know, like a December 1st deadline, some December 3rd, but um, make sure to also have like an Excel sheet or a list somewhere where you're centralizing all the PhD programs um, that you wanna to apply to you along with the deadlines. Some is also November 30th or, or something like that, but it's all within this like, you know, plus minus one week period. Um, also making a list of like, do you meet the course requirements needed? Um, you know, um, meaning that like, let's say you are, you know, you've majored in neuroscience, right? But you wanna go into computer science. And so when you're applying to a computer science like PhD program, they might be asking for like, you know, courses that, that they strongly recommend that you, you've taken in undergrad or something, right? So that's what we mean by, did you, do you meet like the course requirements required? Um, and also, do you have the appropriate or the good amount of research experience for that PhD um, program? Next, what, you, what we recommend that you ask yourself, right, when you're applying for PhD programs, do you, does your research you know, on that type of work the professor is interested in working with, right, align? So are there at minimum, right, three PIs? Um, but I know, so Rob and I, we're like, yo, five professors, right? So like minimum, I would say five professors, but three to five minimum three um, I, you know, that you're excited to work with, right, in that PhD program. The reason why we say that is because the first one, right, like let's say the PI might be, um, you know, be not ten, you know, not tenured in that year that you join, like they are not in that school anymore. Number two, right, that second PI that you're really interested in working with might be on sabbatical, right, so you can't even like work with that PI. Uh, number three is probably just like you know, they're so popular. And so maybe that like, you've rotated or, you, or you know, and you're interested in joining, but they don't have a space for you or even the funding, um, right? And so it's important to identify minimum three professors. Um, yeah, so along with that front, are they are the PIs accepting students into their labs, right? So it's okay to ask up front, right? Like, hey, are you accepting students this year? If so, can I rotate? You know, versus like, oh, can I rotate? And then you're figuring out that you love this lab, but you know, that PI just doesn't have funding or they're not accepting students. And that's like, you know, um, and that happens. So be upfront, ask them, right? Um, straight up, like, are you accepting students this year? Um, and then, yeah, and then visiting lab websites, reading relevant papers, and then contacting grad students to learn more about the lab because we have nothing to lose, right? And so we're probably the most honest people that, that you know, you're probably gonna uh, wanna communicate with. And so um, meaning like, you know, you probably wanna be connected to grad students and ask them, are you guys happy in the lab? Are you guys happy with the PhD program? Do you like where you're working, right? Do you like Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut? Um, do you like New York City, right? What are the pros and cons of that? Um, third thing that you wanna consider is contacting professors. Um, if you're interested in working with them ahead of time. Um, that's not necessary, right? So some people do do that, but you don't need to. But with that being said, it's very, it's required for certain PhD programs, right? So for example, BME, computer science, right? Um, ecology and evolution, biology, physics, psych psychology. And so these are the programs where they, in the application, they kind of want, they, they ask you which PI that you've identified and working with, and you've already established a connection and work, you know, and communicating that you're going to work with them. Um, yeah, so these are, these tend to be like the non-rotation based programs. Um, okay. And then along, you know, continue on with this list and preparing to apply for graduate programs, right? Um, obviously writing your personal statement, right? Which I think many of you guys are probably in a thick of, of doing. Um, and then, yeah, knowing it's important that, you know, first drafts don't need to be perfect. I think with a lot of, you know, scientific writing, um, the, the activation energy, right? This is just this barrier that, okay, well, I have to start somewhere, something. I think once you go over this hump, it's, it's okay that even if it's just an outline um, or you know a, a rough draft that's maybe a page over or something over the limit, that's okay, right? You have something and that's, that's the most important thing. Um, yeah, and then take relevant graduate preparation exams as needed. Um, we'll be going over this like later. And so, you know, knowing whether or not if your PhD program of interest, right, requires you to take the GRE or GRE separate test. I know that for actually us, some BME programs too, um, they actually require still the GRE. Um, and then maybe considering taking the GRE if like your undergrad GP is not too, too great. 
Um, but with that being said, even if your GPA is low, but your research background and experience is stellar, don't let you know your low you know GPA prohibit you or you know from applying to PhD programs. Um, also considering lesser recommendation, right? Uh, which Rob will also go over later on in this workshop, which mentors, right, you know, should you reach out to, right, to write strong, right, and an emphasis on strong, strong letters of recommendation. Um, and, and I want you guys to also really think about, right, like how long have you known that person and in what capacity did that person, right, know you? So meaning, for example, let's say you wanted to reach out to a professor who you probably only interacted with twice in office hours, right? You probably would not want to go to a professor versus, you know, um, a mentor, right? Like a, a research, like a PI who you've known for, you know, two months, right? day in day out through a summer internship you probably want to reach out to that right uh advisor instead for a letter of recommendation um okay and then lastly is a financial cost right so you know it sucks that it's this way but each grad school you know application or PhD program the application costs around uh 70 to 130 dollars so it's it's quite expensive but but y'all you know some of you guys i know you're in our gsmi like nfc program and so we got you. We have fee waivers. And with that being said, even if you're not part of the program, um, know that, you know, you have nothing to lose if you just email the registrar or the um, the directors of graduate admissions and be like, hey, um, I am from a low income socioeconomic background and it'll be great. I'm highly interested in, in applying to this program. It'll be great if there's like a fee waiver of some sort. Um, they might ask you for some evidence of, you know, some, you know, like low socioeconomic status or whatever. And so, um, yeah, but then like, it doesn't hurt to ask for fee waivers. So I strongly suggest for you guys applying this year or the next or whenever, email the PhD program, the registrar or the director of admissions, ask them, seeing if they actually give out fee waivers. It won't, it doesn't hurt anyone. Um, and then also, if you guys um, are attending the, uh, conferences like SACNIS or Abercams, um, there's so many like PhD programs, like literally recruiting at these conferences. And if you are at a, ten, a participant in these fairs, in these conferences, straight up, you are given a fee waiver, right? If you just go to the booth and then they'll, they'll like 99% of the time, they're going to give you a fee waiver just on the premise that you are presenting at these conferences. Okay. So um, along with that front, right, which is preparing to apply for PhD programs, how do you choose, right? So let's say you have like a list of like 20 PhD programs and you kind of want to condense that a bit. So first things first, you know, like you kind of want to think about the research field, right? So obviously choose a program that's most closely related to your academic major or research field, right? And so let's say if you have a, a major, you've made, you've majored about chemistry and you have three major research experiences in biochemistry. And then if you apply to something like mechanical engineering, I mean, you're probably not getting to the mechanical engineering PhD program, right? So um, kind of, uh, yeah, just like um, knowing yourself and applying to a discipline that, you know, that is closely aligns with your, your background. However, right, let's say like you did major in biology and you're like, dang, like I'm really interested in neuroscience, right? So if it's kind of like associated with your background, but it's not in like your main field, um, you know, just know you'll likely have to fill some kind of course requirements before applying. Um, and then also, you know, be ready to justify your switch, right? So let's say you have like three research experiences in biology, but then there was this like your most recent major research experience was like neuroscience. And then I think it's important to justify, let's say in your personal statement, like how to justify, you know, your switch in the field. Second, uh, research laboratories, right? So that goes with, you know, uh, what I, I mentioned with like, you know, identifying minimum three, but low key five, right? So finding at least five professors you're interested in working with. Um, because yeah, working with a specific professor is not guaranteed. Again, they might have space, they might not have funding or they're away on sabbatical. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it doesn't also hurt to be in contact with the PI. So email them um, to, to, to express your interest in working with them and applying to a PhD program. Um, and yeah, and they have space to take on students. Thirdly, um, you know, let's say like you're 
you might, yeah, you, you don't want to become a professor, right? Like with a PhD, but you're like, you know, I want to be a leader. I want to be, you know, um, a boss, right? Like you want to have your own startup or something like that. And so that might require you to get an MBA, right? And so certain PhD programs, they have like dual um, degree, you know, joint programs. And so, um, you know, it, I, yeah, let's say like for an MD, MBA, that's common or MD, MPH that's common. Um, I believe like you Chicago, they might have PhD, MBA, the dual degree. And so, um, you know, look into that, right? And so you might want to apply to a PhD program because they have, they allow you to do biotech internships. Um, you could audit classes. Like, let's say if you want to do an MD after a PhD, you can audit medical classes. Um, yeah, dual degree opportunities. And there's like a really strong career development, like, you know, a career center at that school. And so that's probably one of the reasons why you want to choose a PhD program. Secondly, is teaching requirements, right? So some schools don't have like an undergraduate student population, it's just graduates, those graduate students. And so um, that might not be, you know, the, the school for you, let's say if you have um, a strong passion for teaching undergrads, right? So some programs may require you to teach like, you know, um, more to supplement your stipend. Um, others might even pay you extra for teaching and some might not even require a teacher at all. And so just knowing yourself and seeing, okay, well, if you do prioritize teaching and you want to have training in that front, then um, this is something also to, to consider when you're choosing a PhD program. And the fifth factor, so this is actually one of the, um, this is like number one or two on my list when I was choosing a Yale, um, is, is location and graduate community. Um, and so finding a place where you'd be happy to live in for five or six years. And people often think that, oh, research will suffice. And like, okay, if I love my research, then that's like, okay, like I'll be happy. But keeping in mind that you're going to be spending um, a big chunk, right, of your life and developing your life in a certain place. And so it's important, let's say, if you need sunshine and you, you thrive in like, you know, weather that is 50 degrees and up, you probably don't want to be in a place like Maine, right? Uh, where it's kind of gloomy all the time or something, or, you know, it's really, really, really cold in winter. Um, so yeah, and, but also not just like about weather um, and location, um, but yeah, it's like, like, let's say that if, you know, you want to find a PhD program that's close to your family because you value family and you know that you need to be um, accessible to your support system, right? And so maybe, you know, consider things like that. Um, but, you know, aside from weather, aside from just like the, the factors like family, um, proximity to family, maybe places that support, you know, diverse communities, right? Um, not just in your program, but also in the campus board also like, but, or like in the general area itself. So if you thrive on like, you know, meeting people from like different backgrounds, like you, you thrive in diversity, maybe, you know, schools in New York City, right? Is like the, the so like New York City would be the place for you. Um, and because it's so rich with like the immigrant experiences and meeting people from like various backgrounds. And so, um, yeah, this is also a, a you know, thing to consider. I, I know for sure that this is one of the top two factors for me when I chose um, New Haven. Um, lastly, it kind of goes with um, the grad student community in, in number five. So number six is diversity, right? So um, are, does the PhD program, does the school have well-established resources, right, for POCs to, to strive in, right, to thrive in? Um, do they have, like, mental health resources that are accessible to you, right? Um, and so on the other extreme, right, maybe you're like, dang, well, well, this is uh, very, very not diverse. Um, and so you might be one of the few people that's like, I don't wanna change this place. I wanna make people feel a little more, you know, a bit uncomfortable, right? And so that's where change starts to happen. So maybe you might be the, pe the person to start a sackness chapter, right, um, at that school. Um, so yeah, so there's things to, to think about. Um, so uh, kind of, yeah along that front um, with choosing a PhD program, then we're kind of funneling in, right? How to choose a research mentor. Um, so choosing professors to work with. So, you know, my number one for choosing my advisor is really like, I, I know that my advisor has a really strong record of mentorship. So it's important to choose professors who are good role models, of course, but they have a solid training, right? Uh, for graduate students, right? So like even looking into their websites, into lab websites and be like, 
do they have information readily available um, of former PhD students? Like, where are they now, right? So meaning, well, if most of the former PhD students have graduated are all in academia, that kind of says something about the lab, right? Or the PI, it's like, okay, well, that is probably a bit more conservative and like traditional and like probably want to push you to also pursue, right, an academic route. Uh, versus like, let's say a PI has a good mixture of graduates, former graduate students who are in venture, doing venture capital or in biotech or also in academia that goes to show, okay, well, maybe this PI is a bit more open-minded, right? And very supportive of students who might not want to go into academic routes, but not academic routes. Um, um, are, is that PI, is that professor a leader, a resident leader in their field, right? So it's, in, it's, difficult to know whether a new or an assistant professor is how they're going to do but then let's say like if you want to have your own lab um and you know it might be worthwhile to also work with a new pi because then you get to literally build the lab with them right so if you do want to start your own lab it's it'll be good to see oh um these are things that you should do as well right um how to set up you know the physical space, but also how do I organize like lab meetings and things like that. Um, yeah, choosing professors also like means like looking for collaborative and supportive environments. Does that PI tend to encourage like collaborations within a department, um, with the rest of the school? Are there external collaborations, right? And so making sure that that lab has a supportive environment. Um, maybe also an excellent publication track record. Um, this is also important, um, if especially if you are looking right for uh, traditional like or academic routes in the future. So like you know, getting a postdoc might mean like okay, you might want to have a bit more of a stronger publication record um, now in graduate school, so that you are set up for a strong you know um, a career like postdoc and faculty whatever. Um, but also it just goes to show as well, like, okay, well, that lab is very active and encourages a lot of collaborations. And so, um, you know, even looking at the, the publications, right, it goes to show how open-minded maybe or how um, explorative is, is that lab, how, um, what some of the projects are doing in that lab, right? Um, yeah, and so choosing professors might also mean like, okay, are they champions or diversity? Um, and then even choosing, like, you know, considering their ethnicity and gender. And I will say that these are rare golden eggs because, I mean, we all know, like, you know, most of the faculty or the professors, right, um, in, the, in these institutions who hold PhDs, are, they're not that, you know, um, diverse, right? They're, a majority of them are not POCs. And so this, I would say these are rare golden eggs. But um, I think it's just also really important to know, like, as long as like that PI is an ally, right, or fosters an inclusive environment where they are recruiting, right, students who are of color, right, um, that also is representative of how, you know, that PI is going to be, right, you get a sense of their mentorship style. Um, okay, and so I believe this is the, the one of the few slides before I, I um, you know, pass the baton to Annabelle, but, um, you know, how many PhD programs should you apply to, right? So apply to as many PhD programs as you see yourself interviewing for and visiting, but I want y'all to know it's probably going to be in person this year. Um, and so I know that, you know, when I applied, I applied to like, I, th I think I said like seven, I only, or something like that. And then it was so hard to fit all the interviews because I was all also a senior undergrad and so imagine literally going to class um and then flying out Thursday morning and then coming back Sunday night and then repeating this for seven weekends right so this is almost two months of just constant traveling so you're exhausted you're being pulled in so many different directions right um and so um be self-aware and just like know that you know if there is a program that you are like meh about maybe don't apply to that um but you know, apply to as many as you can, and then um, I guess like just know, just really knowing yourself and being self-aware, right? Um, so let's say like, yeah, again with the weather, if you see yourself not being in Maine, maybe you don't want to apply and like spend hundred bucks on that application, right, for a program that you're like meh about. Um, yeah. With that being said, right, applications cost something to one hundred thirty dollars, but fewer are available at these conferences or just an email away. 
And then I will say compile a list of, you know, maybe 10 and 12 PhD programs, right? Um, these are just some of like the rough numbers that we have, but um, obviously apply to PhD programs that are like amazing, but, you know, kind of with like college colleges, right? Like apply to ones that are also like quote unquote good, um, safety, make sure that all just generally places that you want to go to um, and that the research aligns with your interests, right? But, uh, but remember, like the core factors, right, with this in this criteria is just program study, right, uh, research mentors, minimum five PIs, um, any special programs like dual degree granting opportunities, um, if they require teaching requirements, um, location, diversity. And then some other finances within the application process. Um, even with the interview stage, when you fly out, right? They're going to give you a certain like number, like let's say you have $600 to spend and all right, like that's going to go towards like your round trip plane, your plane travel, right? But then um, if it exceeds over a certain amount, then it might eat, like have to come out of pocket. And then you might, you know, be in a hotel and then that hotel asks you to, um, you know, uh, put down your credit card just for an incidental, like let's say you break like the Keurig in the hotel room or something. So take into account maybe like the rent you'll be paying that month or something. And so set aside some money in advance for this possibility and keep all your receipts, right? So because um, the PhD program will compensate for that, will reimburse you for any anything like travel to airport, like your Uber, your Lyft, like take screenshots on your phone, right? Of that receipt. Um, meals not hosted by the program, um, your first and last day of the interview weekend. So let's say you're in the airport and you're waiting and you're like, oh shit, there's a Panera bread, right? And so you're spending $20 on some soup and a sandwich. Take a picture of that receipt, keep the receipt. Um, that PhD program will reimburse you. Um, yeah, so you'll be compensated. Okay. All righty. So uh, let's take a break for some questions uh, and we'll, we'll let it, uh, any of our panelists uh, answer them. So uh, one of the first uh, questions is, how do PIs view non-traditional candidates, uh, at least those that have been 10 years out of school, uh, if anyone wants to take that? Great, so I will probably take that one. Uh, I think, uh, Alma, uh, to answer your question, uh, the main, uh, I think what matters is even if you took uh, 10 years, let's say from your college degree before applying to grad school, as long as you have been uh, working in a research lab, build up research experience, uh, have done something uh, that can uh, show you are working towards a career in science, that's fine. Uh, there have been, uh, at least during my years in, in uh, PhD, I have seen uh, a couple of candidates who have been 10 years out of, uh, out of uh, since college in doctoral programs. So the main thing is uh, just make sure that you um, explain in your personal statement why you took that gap year. Ideally, you have research experience during that gap year. And if you don't explain why you don't have research experience and what motivated you to go back into science after that uh, gap year. All right, uh, we'll take uh, two more uh, and then we'll leave the rest uh, towards the end. Uh, let's see, uh, even if we uh, had close relations with our professors, but did not stay in touch after college, what is your advice on reaching out to them in terms of asking a strong rec letter? I, uh, Daisy or Anibal, if you wanna answer this one. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, um, sorry. Um, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Uh, even if uh, it provides the first question in Q and A. So even if you had a close relationship with your professor, uh, but didn't stay in touch in yeah. college after college, uh, how would you reach out to them to ask for a rec letter? Yeah, Luis. I was looking at this question earlier, and I think it's a really important one to ask. Um, just because. Sometimes time flies by and we lose touch with some professors. And I really think, um, and to do that, you can start um, by like a soft approach, just like touching base with the professor, mentioning them what you're thinking about of doing in the in in your next steps, and kind of asking them how they what they think about the process, and and kind of see tease how how they respond to that message. Um, I really think 
that's one way to do it. And then you can go from there the, after that initial contact. And so, yeah, I don't know, Daisy, you have anything else? But I think just uh, go ahead, Daisy. Yeah, I think um, kind of like going, you know, off of what Annabelle said, just if you had close relationships, so, so like with professors, you know, um, if you've had a close relationship with your your professor, like from college, that relationship like will last, right? And so like that person was probably a mentor. And so when that person agrees to be like mentor you in some in, in capacity, like, you know, that mentorship, that relationship lasts. They, they kind of expect you almost, right? Like 20 years from now, let's say you're applying to another job, right? Post PhD, they kind of like, like expect, okay, well, this person is going to, right? Um, ask me for an LOR. So I think, you know, it doesn't hurt just like a soft email, be like, hey, um, I'm applying to PhD programs, like, you know, this semester, this this year, this winter. And so, um, you know, can we chat on the phone or can we have a video call and just like catch up, um, things like that. And that's and during that conversation, that's when you bring up, hey, like, you know, will you be willing to like write me a strong LOR or something like that? Um, and so, yeah, just know that when uh, someone agrees to like mentor you and you've had this, not even had, you have a close relationship, right, with this professor, um, they kind of expect, you know, already like, all right, I'm probably going to be writing this person an LOR for many, many, many things. Even when you're when you're PhD program and you're you're applying for a fellowship or grants, you're probably also going to be asking this professor in college, right, for an LOR for the fellowship or grant. So, yeah, just email and um, set up a conversation, so. Yeah, great. Thanks, Daisy and Annabelle. And I'm just gonna answer one question before uh, we move on to the next step and the rest we'll answer towards the end. Uh, is it necessary to contact a PI first before the application process? So uh, this one, it really depends for a field. If you're applying to PhD programs in psychology, computer science, ecology, and evolutionary biology, it's extremely important to uh, reach out to a professor ahead of time. Just because, as Stacy mentioned earlier, uh, if you apply to one of those PhD programs and don't uh, email a professor, they won't know who you are. They're like, oh, well, we have these candidates to apply, but none of them have met with me. So I don't know if they're interested in me. So let me go and give the spots to the people that have met, took, have met with me and took the time to learn about my work. So it's extremely important to do that. However, uh, this varies a lot per field. Uh, if you're applying to PhD programs in the biological sciences, for the most part, such as uh, biochemistry, neuroscience, cell, virology, pharmacology, um, it's not necessarily uh, required to contact a professor ahead of the application process, especially if it's a rotation-based program, just because in those programs, you start reaching out to professors you're interested in working with after you got into the PhD program. So for those, it's more specific to... Uh, um, certain fields. If you're unsure, you want to go into the PhD program uh, uh, webpage of the school you're interested in. Every once in a while, they have some disclaimers that uh, uh, it's encouraged to reach out to certain professors uh, ahead of the application deadline. And uh, yeah, all right. Then we'll move on to uh, Animal. Hi, thanks so much, Rob. And Daisy, thank you for that great introduction. So now we're going to be talking about how to apply to the PhD program itself. And this part of the talk will be divided in two components. The first one being standardized testing, GRE, TOEFL, IELTS. The second part being the application timeline that's suggested. Now, let's get started. Um, today I'll be talking about, firstly, the graduate record examination or GREs, more specifically about the general record examination, not the subject specific tests. The reason for that is that uh, there's a rapidly evolving situation. Some programs do require subject tests, others don't. And the consideration for what a GRE is required for is constantly changing across programs. But if you have any extra questions, we can chat about it as well. Now, the general rec graduate record examination is about a four hour exam that's required um, for some admissions into some graduate schools. And the reason I have required what Eric quotes and some graduate schools is because there's been a recent shift in at least the STEM biomedical PhD programs towards not requiring it because there, there has been emergent research about um, how effective this test is actually uh, 
for PhD for, for PhD students and how much of a success can you measure with this um, a test? And so many individuals across the states and across the world have been working on the different lists showing um, what programs are not required in the GRE. For humanities and STEM, you can see that there's a website called grenotrequired.com, which you can check out and you have a list of many, many programs that don't require the, um, the GRE. And um, I personally um, I handle this biogre.info, which looks at biological and biomedical PhD programs across the United States with over 415, I believe is the latest number of programs that don't require it. So there's, there's an extra tab in the biogre.info for those who are doing psychology, uh, astrophysics, astronomy. There's an extra tab in the, the spreadsheet that you can also check out. Now, the reason I'm saying all these, re I'm telling you about all these resources for what programs don't require the GRE is because this is a very expensive test. It's $205. And to report the scores to individual universities that you're interested in, it's about $27 extra. So that's about a $400 uh, price tag if you're applying to, let's say, 10 schools, bringing this to 270. However, you can get up to four freebies on the day of the exam if you do know what institutions you want to apply to. If you don't use those four universities on the day of the exam, you need to pay the full cost, the $27. Now, there is a GRE test fee reduction program. However, there's some caveats that you need to consider for this. Yes, it is 50% off, but let's say you send the request today. It might take two to three business days to apply to reach the ETS office. And once they reach the ETS office, it can depend on how backed up they are in the office to accept your request. So this could be a week, a month, three months. And after they approve it, then they're gonna get back to you um, the physical waiver which you can use in the testing site. So it's a long and lengthy process. So the, I think really the best way around this is really to just contact your school and program of interest and determine if the GRE is or is not being required. Now, the GRE is divided into several components, verbal, quantitative, and analy analytical writing. Verbal and quantitative go from 130 to 170, and analytical from zero to six. The GRE scores that are good or average um, will vary and depend on your specific programs. As a general rule of thumb, 155 on both verbal and quantitative is average, and the four on analytical writing is average as well. So a great score will be anything over 160. However, that's really subjective to the specific program you're applying to. So in this graph, you can see how on the top, the top axis, you have your verbal scores, bottom axis you have quantitative scores, meaning that if you're applying to an English program, you clearly want something close to 170. And if you're applying to a quantitative program like math, so a math program, you want a very high plot. For those of you, us in the physical sciences, um, the range is around this area, 155, 160, I believe. Um, and so that's important to know so you can put into the context what a good score or a, an average score is. Now, an extra uh, standardized testing metric that some programs require is a TOEFL or IELTS. Um, these are English proficiency exams that are valid for two years with the TOEFL and IELTS. And the big difference between them, besides their prices, with the TOEFL being $180 and the IELTS being $200, um, is that also more uh, schools accept the TOEFL then they accept the IELTS. The specific caveats and interpretations of how some, per, some schools interpret the efficiency of these tests, which is why some schools accept one and not the other. Now, just as we saw earlier that you have to pay $27 to send GRE scores to each individual school you're interested in, for the TOEFL, you also need to send $20 for each school you're interested in. So the prices keep stacking up. And so, some schools are becoming more relaxed about these English proficiency exams because they're realizing that English proficiency is not limited to being in the States. Um, so it is important for, for you to ask about um, a possible interview or a possible chat with maybe the program coordinators 
as they mentioned, you have conferences like Sagnas, Our Camps, which are great places to, for you to visit and talk to the recruiters. And specifically there, once you talk to them, you can tell them like, hey, I'm a fluent English speaker, although I'm not, I'm not from uh, English as a first language kind of state or country. So this, in this way, this diagram helps a little bit. If English is your first, your native language, if it is, TOEFL will not be required. If it's not, the next question will be if you obtain your bachelor's in the US or where as a place where English was the primary mode of instruction. And if it is, you can go to yes and, and then TOEFL was, will not be required for you. And if not, then the TOEFL will be. Um, I'm working on this uh, list, curating a list for PhD TOEFL. And, and it has minimum scores and uh, 200 for 200 plus schools, which you can check out um, if it applies to you. Now, the English proficiency test scores will also vary. You have your 12 for internet based, which although it says internet based, you do need to go to a uh, sender for taking the test, except that it's in a computer. There's also the TOEFL that's paper-based. On I get those are different in that sense. So there's four sections for 30 points each. You have reading, listening, speaking, and writing. The reading, listening, and writing are taken kind of together. And what I mean by cut scores is that um, in a in a range from zero to um, yep to from zero to 100, you the uh, schools consider 90 to 100 being average. It doesn't mean that if you apply to a program with a 90 to 100, you will be rejected. It really only means that um, if you do fall into that range, you might be asked for extra proficiency examination or evaluation. And if you have um, more than a 26 in speaking. So um, it's actually really interesting how some programs may have loopholes around this exam because some programs may not require you to take a proficiency test. But once you enter the PhD program, they may ask you to TA or um, give a class to some undergrad students. And then you may be asked to actually take some proficiency exam in order to be able to get that class. So it's important that you can also ask other students and the PhD program you're interested in applying to about this. It's a really great question if they do need to take an extra proficiency test in order to TA. So with that being said, um, we're gonna start the second part of the, of the how to apply to a PhD program. However, um, I wanna see if there's any question on the standardized testing components. So I just wanna open the floor to that or Rob, you can let me know if we can leave it until the end. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have uh, a couple of them. Uh, if our GRE score is not outstanding, would it be more hurtful to submit or should we just not submit it at all if not required? Yeah, that's a really good question because, because many programs say, oh, they're optional or they're um, not really uh, required to, to be submitted. And the, big que the bigger question is, how do you feel about maybe your GPA? If you do think that you may be... Um, nervous about applying to certain graduate school, G the GRE can only complement maybe GPA scores and how good you are at testing. It does not measure your intellectual or scientific capacity at any level. So really, if it's not outstanding, and you, but you, have, you can complement that um, your GPA with like amazing research, I would say it's not really submitted, but it will really depend on how you how you feel. And once you talk to maybe the graduate students and the school you're interested in, kind of survey them. Because right now, the way that applications work when evaluating students is that they're gonna tell you, they're gonna give your package to the PIs and evaluating committee. And once they have the, the your paperwork, they'll see your personal statements, your CV, and the GRE will not be there. And the, at least in the committees where, I, where I've served, they can get your GRE if they think they want to know a little bit more about you, but it's not something they're gonna know firsthand. So in that sense, um, I guess you can evaluate the pros and cons on that process. I just wanna add to that, Annabelle. Uh, 
So in short, uh, the G GRE exam, uh, as Annabelle mentioned, is quite optional these days. Uh, there have been some exceptions where some universities required a general GRE exam. Uh, as anyone mentioned, you only want to submit it if you get a really, really good score. If you don't get a really good score, let's say above a 160 or high 150s, uh, that, uh, that GRE score is considered as an application factor in addition to everything else. So it's like your personal statement, your rec letter, your GPA, and whatever your GRE score is if you submit it. So that's the way you want to be a little bit careful about uh, whether to submit it or not, only if you feel that you have uh, done well. I will say, though, uh, I have recently found out about uh, the importance of taking the GRE in physics. So in, uh, in the physics field, uh, sometimes it's a little bit more competitive where um, a lot of the applicants coming in uh, are you are required for the most part from uh, most, not all universities, the physics GRE subject test. So this is one that you really have to take and you really have to do well, just because unlike the GRE generally, where it's, um, uh, it's there's no indicator of grad school success and high GRE score, the physics GRE subject test is pretty much how well are you familiar with that material. Uh, and uh, the familiarity of that uh, is going to be really helpful. Uh, if you score really high in a physics GRE score, it uh, it might show that you're able to, you have a grasp of the knowledge when you start your physics graduate program. So I will say that the physics GRE subject test definitely, I think uh, uh, for that particular field, it's weighed a lot more important than the general GRE, which is op optional. So just keep that in mind uh, that the uh, physics GRE is uh, weighed a little bit more. Uh, so make sure you have uh, ample of time to study. And uh, obviously um, um, try your best to uh, take part of, uh, how do you say, either online training workshops. Magoosh is one of them that uh, it's quite affordable to study for the general GRE. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow, well, sorry. Uh, we got another question, Anibal. Uh, do I need uh, the TOEFL results before applying? Yeah, so actually some programs um, have very flexible uh, options for this. And many programs maybe don't require you to submit it with the package, but others do. So it really comes to a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I will chat a little bit more about that. Rob, do we have, in the next slide, Rob, do we have any other questions? Uh, we have a couple, but uh, we can an, uh, ask, answer them at the end of this next section. Sounds good. Yep, because I really want to get to this point. Um, so actually, yeah, it's just, I'll get to that question in two slides. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the bigger point is um, now in September is really, well, we're at the end of September, but don't worry, you're still in time for thinking about the the exams, the standardized testing, but more importantly, as Stacy mentioned, listing schools, listing PhD programs that you're interested in, noting deadlines and requirements for each of these programs. There's a lot of requirements that you're gonna be having to juggle um, between schools from personal statement, diversity statements, GRE course, and you may get lost. Like I felt like I got lost while handling all these applications. And you need to be, make sure you survey programs about application fee waivers. There's some caveats to fee waivers. Some of them require you to show low income background. Others you can just get by being part of a program like GSMI in New York City. And others have actually GPA requirements. So just make sure you can ask the programs about these fee waivers, just because there's many times where students I know have paid and there's really no way to reimburse. So make that really your first question once you meet a recruiter about the possibility of fee waivers. Um, and start writing your statements early and often. Personally, it took me about nine drafts on my personal statement to get to a point where I thought, okay, I'm happy with this. It will never truly be ready, but this is a point where I'm, I'm, I feel good enough to submit. Now, um, the strong letter of recommendation will be a very important um, uh, pretty recurring theme in this presentation, as it already has been. It's in bold, it's in caps, it's underlined. And there's a specific reason for this because there is such a thing as a weak letter of recommendation. And 
you know you need to look for people that or that really have seen you grow as a professional and don't ask professors who don't know you well because really it can be a very dangerous game there there have been uh, people i met that the professors have agreed to write a letter of recommendation but they've written a really bad one at the end and so just make sure you you ask them for a strong letter and you can educate them to write the strongest letter for you and there are more there's there will be more on that in a bit. Now, September, besides making that list and thinking about letter of recommendation writers, it's a, it's a time to prepare for GREs for standardized testing. September, October is totally good because you need to make sure you look up available test dates and testing centers. Now, you can also take the GRE and all these standardized tests online. After COVID occurred, there were a lot of shifting towards this kind of method. However, there's a lot of barriers to this because um, there have there's very specific software and very specific areas of work that you need to make in order for your exam to be valid and for them to agree to give you the exam online. So there's a lot of details that you need to consider if you're taking the test online. As for looking up available test dates and testing centers, you need to put into context where you are right now in the world. So for example, Puerto Rico just got hit by a very bad hurricane. And the only testing center in the island is in the south, like three hours away from the capital, where maybe electricity and power grid has not been able to be restored yet. And so you really need to give your mission, like the people in the, in the programs you're interested in, that context, because they won't know. They won't know that, for example, you can't take any subject test for GRE in Puerto Rico right now. You can only take the general GRE test. And so those are important conditions to, to let your program know about. Now, October 31 is really the latest to take the test to submit the scores for PhD application. And you can actually take it on October 31 because it will take, it will take about two to three weeks for your test results to get back. Now, with that being said, if you can study two to three months before the exam, that's great. If you can't, that's also completely fine. There no need to fret right now. There's offered, there's uh, many um, resources online. Uh, Scott just, uh, sorry, Rob just talked about my gush and uh, some preparation courses that they offer for verbal um, section studying. And there's also quantitative sections um, that you can actually take from examples and GRE from the past and re review them. So you'll get access to these slides and these links afterwards. So the question is, do you still need to take the GRE? If, so again, ETS allows you to take the online version of the GRE due to COVID-19 um, shifting in the kind of like how the world kind of works now. And you can take the exam up to five times within a year. It is very expensive. Now, the GRE scores are valid for five years. If you decide not to apply or not to not to not to submit them even uh, until you take it again now there's something else i want to say and, and it's on this note of how accessible these exams are um at least for me when i took it the first time it took me about 40 hours of minimum wage salary in order to be able to pay for this exam and all the application fees associated and these are things that programs will never know really they see you as a student and they know you study but they don't really know all the background work you need to do to get to where you want and so um kind of connecting to the to the question from earlier yes it is important to apply to to the programs with these test scores already in hand however really consider how important um the other components of your applications are just because to this, there's personal statements and there's other things that need to be done. And as the GRE's importance has like kind of decreased throughout the years, that just means there's other things the committee will be looking at. So you need to balance really how much importance you're giving to the GRE versus maybe a personal statement where you highlight all your, all your research and you can show the committee in two minutes how good of a student you are. And so it really comes down to balancing what's most important for you and to really, when you put this in a, in a list and a spreadsheet, like Daisy mentioned earlier, you can really better understand um, what you need to do to get to where you want.
So for in October, you can take the GRE, you can still take the GRE in English proficiency. Um, you can apply for fellowships. The NSF GRE is due, I believe, in October. So check out the scientific Latino fellowship uh, fellowship components um, on our website, and have professors and colleagues look over your personal statement. You don't really only want someone that tells you that's nice. I, I like your personal statement. You want them to verify coherence and comprehensiveness because the you need the committee to be able to know you in a, a minute. There's many applications that they need to go through. And so you need good hooks, you need a good story to make them really understand who you are really fast. Now, remind your letter writers about the letters of recommendation. They will forget, I'm telling you. They always do. So make sure to send them that spreadsheet that you have with all the different schools that you're interested in and the deadlines. It will really help them and ultimately help you because they can keep track of if they were in the letters of recommendation or not. Um, also attend virtual science and professional development conferences, as Daisy said. You can see Abercamp, Cygnus, and BME for application fee waivers. And if you are applying to programs in ecology, evolutionary biology, computer science, and psychology, just as Scott and just as Rob mentioned, I don't know why I keep calling you Scott. <laughs> um, just make sure to, to contact professors you're interested in working with because these programs may need to um, may need you to have um, affiliate faculty already identified. November to December is a final reminder to get these letters of recommendation writers to um, write your, your, on your behalf. Your final letters to personal statements, email programs about application fee waivers, and submit applications a week around before deadlines. I'm telling you to do this with a time in advance because my first time applying, which as you all know by now, was a failure. Um, I did also email a program with a statement from another university and they didn't vibe with that. And just make sure you don't make that rookie mistake because I have and it's not good. Um, so make sure you do things with due diligence and time in advance. Um, most application deadlines are early December. Now, after submitting graduate school application, the ball will be on their court. From December to February, you should start hearing back. And if you don't hear back from by the end of February, do not forget. Remember, during this process, no answer can be a good answer. So don't take a no answer as a rejection yet. But if you are nervous or you are a little bit concerned about maybe having sent a statement to a wrong university or something really catastrophic, like some statements never submitted through the websites, um, then you can kind of like start thinking about options or just really emailing the committee and trying to reach an agreement with them. If all fails, consider a prep program. It's one of the best decisions I've made. As for being rejected by 10 programs, it really affected me as a professional and a scientist. And it felt really bad getting all these 10 letters saying, oh, we don't want you in our program. And it, it, it was really hard. So a prep program actually validated me as a scientist furthermore and really propelled me to believe in myself more as a scientist, which ultimately led me to have a great application cycle the next time around. So uh, graduate school interview, once you get them, it's not an acceptance. You also need to bring your A-game to that place, be it virtual or in-person, because they only invite candidates they are interested in accepting, and they have limited spots. So you need to make sure you bring your A-game for that. For international students, you might have a Skype or phone interview before the in-person in -person invite is sent. And for non-biology programs, they will notify you on acceptance via emails and have visiting weekends after acceptance. Um, so that that may shift after COVID and how things are moving right now with the state of the world, just making things more in person. But just keep in mind that not every program will have the same method of inviting you back to the university for interviews. PhD program recruitment will happen for biological and biomedical program from January to March, non-biology from January to early April, and make sure to learn more about the program, interview with faculty, and interact with students. Um, they just mentioned that we're the best resource, really. 
and the PhD program acceptance offers will go from February to April. Um, this offer will include information about monthly stipend, maybe moving stipend, insurance. And if you don't have that information, ask because this will be your home for the next five to six years. The decisions will be on April 15, which is tax, tax date, and you will accept and deny programs. It will be a bittersweet day, um, but kindly decline the others. Email those faculty at interview you and the time for them to you. And remember to email and or tweet to everyone that helped you in this process, from your family members, so maybe mentors that were really wonderful during the process. So yeah, I think that will be all for my part. And let me know if you have any other questions. Great. Thank you, Annabelle, for that. Uh, let's answer some questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, Uh, okay, let's go with, uh, uh, I am a career changer with a bachelor's of science in health science. I'm interested in uh, master programs, uh, eventually a PhD uh, in biotechnology. I have taken bridge courses for the master's, but I have not been able to gain any uh, research experience in a lab. Uh, any suggestions? Yeah, I definitely think um, what helped me most was applying to a prep program and to really fill in more of that continuous research, as I mentioned. I had separate research experiences throughout the summers and that kind of hurt my application. PhD programs want to see consistency and really focus on one specific area. So if you if you have the opportunity, I would suggest to really try to do a one year in any specific lab. It doesn't have to be a prep program. It could be some other position, but I really think showing the committees that you're dedicated to science even after your trajectory, which sounds amazing, really, um, would really be powerful. So, yeah. Thank you, Annabelle. And just to quickly add on that, as Annabelle mentioned, even if you don't, if you decide not to do a prep program, try to find research experience in your master program, because you are a master student. If you can find anything, let's say within a university, you're more than welcome to reach out to universities in your surrounding area because you're a student and you're volunteering your time to do research in a lab. Uh, so definitely, uh, that would be one of the approaches uh, to do. Uh, okay, we got one. Uh, can I use the same statement of purpose in all schools? Uh, and related to that, Anibal, uh, is there any way I can scale down my statement of purpose from 1,000 to 500 words? It seems like a Herculean task. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Statements of purpose can be tricky um, just because um, sometimes schools have specific um, questions they want you to address. So I guess in that sense, towards the first question, you need to make sure that you're answering what's being asked for the specific institution. And uh, I guess on the, so the short answer is you can just be careful you don't over, overlay any, any questions from other programs into your story. And towards that second question of Herculean, uh, task, which it does sound like um, it's possible. You know, I really think the best way to cut down in anything we write is to give it to someone else and be like, here it is. How, what do you think it's unnecessary in this document? Because we're often really, we're often not biased in a way. So really, I would suggest just providing the statement to someone else and being like, what do you think was unnecessary here? And then kind of go from there. Great. And then just to add on that, uh, just because it's relevant to the next part. Um, so let's say you're applying to 10 different schools and 33% of them are 500 words, 33% of them are 1,000 words, and 33% are 1,500 words. My general strategy is let's write a personal statement with 1,500 words. Let's make it broad. Uh, that way you have all of the material necessary telling about your story, your research experience. And then after that, once you have like a really good find foundation, you tailor it to the schools with the highest word limit. And then after that, start truncating that like if three schools are 1500 words, let me do that application first. And then the next one's a thousand words, let me do those applications next. Uh, in terms of trunca truncating it, you may wanna either decrease the research experience or research topics that you discuss, uh, or as Anibal mentioned, definitely the more people you have editing it, uh, the better uh, it will be. And then we'll answer one more before uh, 
let's see, from the answer of a university in the interview, how much time do they usually give you to get an offer, to get an acceptance? So let's say after you finish your interview. Yeah, so it really will depend. Um, I did have programs that were really fast at getting back to me. Um, so I, I would say you apply in December, right? And then some programs go faster than others. Some go for Christmas break. But I would say one to two weeks I would be a good amount of time. And if you don't hear back, you can also email them and ask them the status of your application. I, I did that for some programs. And I, I learned from that email, actually, that they had not even looked at my application. And so I really think you can give them out one to two, maybe three week window after maybe February and March kind of deadlines to, to get back to you. So, yeah. Great. And then uh, just a, a general one that I want to answer. So in general, I have a good GPA, but there were a couple of classes in which I got a B or a C. Uh, does it matter too much? So uh, I would say it really depends. So let's say you started your college first year and you didn't do so well academically in your core STEM classes. But as you went on through your junior and senior year, you did much better academically. I know some admission committees directors, they focus on that junior senior year because by then you have taken several of your core classes and are uh, proficient in studying for those classes or are aware of the expectations of how to study for those classes. So that's weight a little bit more uh, than classes taking your first year when you're just adapting to a new environment. I will also say that if you feel that uh, your GPA is in that grade or if you didn't take if you didn't do so well academically in certain classes that you think are important, you could always ask one of your rec letters uh, to include it in uh, their recommendation letter. Uh, you could ask a PI, like for example, like, look, maybe I didn't do too good in uh, molecular biology, but I have been doing research in molecular biology for two years. So uh, that PI can speak just because you didn't do well academically, they have enough, uh, they have shown the potential to be a strong candidate based on their research experience. The main thing is if it's a glaring GPA, let's say below a 3.0, uh, or uh, 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 a streak of really bad uh, like uh, grades, you want to address it because if you don't, they're going to they're gonna make up their own mind. They're going to think, okay, they got this because they didn't study. Instead of you addressing it or your uh, rec letter writers addressing it. And once again, um, yeah, I would say focus on the rec letter writers to address it. Every once in a while, if you feel like you want to address it, you could say, look, despite working full time or some financial circumstances, which was the reasons why I didn't do too poorly, uh, didn't do too great in one of these classes, I was able to overcome it by X, Y, and C. All right. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna get started uh, with the next part and then we'll leave the majority of questions towards the end. Uh, and then th uh, thank you, Anibal uh, and Daisy. So uh, what are the grad school application components? So uh, in short, the grad school application program uh, components are uh, the online application, which contains a whole bunch of demographics, background, uh, your education, your transcript, your uh, unofficial, most schools require you to send this in. Official, they require you to send this in if they give you an offer. Uh, the CV and the resume, which is an overview of your uh, academic and extracurricular activities. And we'll go into that a little bit later. Your letters of recommendation, uh, which discuss your your scientific and personal qualities and the nature of the relationship with your mentor and your personal statement, uh, your scientific interests, your research experience, your professional goals, interest in the program. All right, so let's get started with the resume. So uh, breaking down the curriculum vitae, CV, which I like to think of it as an extended resume. So uh, mainly it's uh, composed of your basic information, such as your name, contact info, education, then your research experience and your relevant employment. You ideally wanna have that really up first, uh, right after your education, because that's you're applying to grad school and a career in research. So you wanna talk about your research experience. Then any publications uh, or oral or poster presentations, then teaching experience, then leadership positions, and uh, then references. References, um, 
in my opinion, it's quite optional to include them in a CV. It's more common for a resume, but you're more than welcome to if you want. All right. So this is just an example of a, a style of the format for the cur sort of curriculum vitae. So here we have a grad student's um, information. So their name, their address, phone number, institution, their email address. In this case, the institution that they went to, uh, the uh, their education, uh, listing their most recent uh, education first. So in this case, uh, she's a PhD candidate uh, at Yale, and then she listed her undergraduate uh, experience uh, at the University of Puerto Rico and the dates uh, that they attended. Okay. And then after that, uh, she listed, uh, and this is very optional in the, um, when you're listening to universities, you're more than welcome to include relevant coursework to the PhD program that you're applying to. This is something that some graduates, prospective grad students do. I didn't do it, but there are some uh, CVs that include it as well. So in this case, Paula listed some of her relevant coursework in sciences uh, that showed that it's quite relevant to the PhD program that she was applying to in molecular and cell development biology. All right. Uh, uh, and then after your education comes your research experience. So for your research experience, in this case, uh, this is just one style of format. Uh, the university uh, that you're uh, from, the department that you worked in, the dates that you worked in, who was your research advisor, you really, really want to include that, uh, the, specifically the PI that you worked under, and then what is your main project. So in here, in this case, uh, instead of saying uh, I looked at serotonin in mice, uh, this particular graduate student talked about using different type of tools to investigate a particular serotonin receptor in the brain uh, involved in behavior. So it's like by adding a little bit more detail, uh, this is a little bit more impactful because it gives you an overview of like what subfield they have experience with. And then they also did some other projects where in this case, um, she looked at neurogenesis in part of the brain using different behavioral paradigms. And she listed these techniques that uh, she learned. So uh, this was actually very helpful because uh, it shows that, oh, she's familiar with a variety of molecular biology uh, techniques. And in terms of what research experience to list, uh, it could be anywhere from, uh, you want to list all of them your undergrad research experience, your summer research, independent study, postgraduate research. For some of you who have high school experience, you can list that as well. Okay, teaching experience. So if you did a master's program and you're applying to a PhD, or if you're an undergraduate student who was able to TA a class, you want to include the teaching experience. So in this case, it's just a format uh, where this PhD candidate uh, pretty much was a TA for this particular class, the semesters that they were involved in, in teaching and the responsibilities uh, involved in TA in this class. So if you have that option uh, of teaching, uh, definitely include it and include uh, your, uh, how many semesters, specific roles uh, and any other relevant teaching experience. And also whether this teaching experience involves uh, mentoring students in a research lab as well. Okay, uh, leadership positions. So uh, grad schools like looking uh, at a candidate as a whole. So yes, you have your research experience, which is extremely important and any presentations, publications, uh, which is, to be honest, publications to undergrad students is very, very variable. So it's not really required in, uh, but uh, if you have uh, other leadership positions, uh, that will be very impactful. So in this case, this particular, a uh, PhD uh, student when she was applying to grad school, she was involved with different organizations, whether it was running science journal clubs or looking over uh, grant applications uh, or involved in some science related activities. So definitely include uh, your leadership positions, your particular role, the dates involved, and what, what particularly, what exactly you did during uh, that time. 
Okay, uh, presentations. So this is just uh, one format that I like to use when discussing my presentations. So in this case, uh, I'm particularly discussing a poster that I have uh, presented. So if you're doing research uh, in a research lab, depending on your lab, it's a very collaborative experience. In my case, I'm presenting, uh, I presented this work uh, during my PhD. And in this case, I, I was a presenting author. So I listed my name in bold, uh, but I also included all of the authors that played a role in, uh, in this work. So it's pretty much the authors and my name in bold or, or in the asterisk is just for the presenting author. If I wasn't a presenting author, but someone presented it, then I would just bold my name wherever it is in the list. Uh, the title of the presentation, where exactly I presented and the location. So you ideally wanna include all your presentations, whether it's national STEM, undergraduate conferences, whether it was at your university or a research symposium, a departmental seminar, any summer research programs. This is because it shows that you have been able to talk about your research at different uh, stages of your early career. All right, and awards. Uh, if you received any awards, you definitely wanna include what they are and a brief description of what exactly you were given that award for. And once again, these awards can be, whether it's university awards, travel awards, poster prizes, scholarships, fellowships, dean list. Uh, it's not necessary to have uh, any awards when you're applying to grad school, but if you have them, definitely include them. Okay. And then just a couple last thoughts on the curriculum vitae. So you ideally want to have a consistent format, font, and language. You want to highlight your important accomplishments first. Uh, and uh, ideally, uh, you definitely want to include all of your accomplishments. And maybe you want to tailor it based on uh, what particularly you're applying to. So for example, I have a curriculum vitae now because I've been a scientist for over a decade now. So I have it roughly 10 to 12 pages. But obviously, no one's going to read 10 to 12 pages. So depending on what I apply to, I take some things out of my uh, master CV and I tailor it based on what exactly I'm applying to that's relevant to the application. So for the CV, I would say for grad school, it could be anywhere from two to six pages. If you have enough material for only one to two pages, that's OK. But just make sure you're highlighting all of your uh, extracurricular and academic activities as well. Um, and then resume, uh, most resumes are one to two pages, ideally one, uh, and, uh, and you want to list relevant experiences. Okay, um, I think I'm just going to answer a few questions before moving on to the rec letter part. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, so specifically for publications, if we have submitted a paper, should we include it in the CV for PhD apps? That's a great question. I would say uh, when you're talking about a publication, you want to say, uh, you want to list the author's name, the name of the paper, and at the end of it, you want to say the status, submitted, uh, in review, accepted. In preparation means you're writing it, so you can definitely do that as well. So you can definitely include it in your CV for PhD apps uh, if it's submitted. Uh, okay. Let me answer one more. If the only research I have is for my undergrad program and professional experience, is that something that can make my application weaker? I will say no, uh, just because it depends on how long you were working on that research uh, experience. Uh, so don't feel that just because you only have one research experience and maybe other people had one, two, three research experiences that your application is any uh, disadvantage. The main thing is how well are you able to talk about your academic uh, research in your personal statement? Uh, so, and also uh, people like consistency. If you were in a research lab for let's say two to three years and you had two to three different research projects, you wanna talk about all two or three of those research projects in your personal statement, just because you have more material to work with. And on the other hand, if you only have one year of research experience and one summer program, in that case, you're obviously going to talk about that one year of research in that one summer program and what you did. So, um, yeah. All right. 
Uh, and then lastly, will no publications make your PhD application weak? No. Uh, in the biological sciences, uh, publications are very, very rare as undergraduate students. You, I'll be honest, you get them by luck. So don't feel that just because you don't have any and someone else has like 10, it's that you don't uh, stand a chance. Uh, if you are undergraduate students, this is how you get publications. It's by chance. It really depends what project was assigned to you. Is your professor collaborating with someone? Uh, did you join a lab when they were finishing a paper and they need someone to finish a couple experiments and you're that person who can do that? It's all by luck. So don't feel that you don't have any any publications doesn't mean you could uh, that your application is weaker. I will say though that in certain fields it's much easier to get publications. So or it might be a little faster, let's say. Uh, so if it's in computer science or physics, I do know a couple applicants who may have publications already. And uh, when they apply to PhD programs, they already have these uh, publications ready. But even if you don't have a publication and you're applying to a university in that field, the main thing is how well can you talk about your research experience? The publication is just uh, more of like, it's just showing that you've worked in, uh, you put in a lot of work and you were able to get a paper published. But once again, it's a lot of variable factors that include into it. Maybe you were in a lab for two to three years and you were able to collect a lot of data to lead to that publication. All right. Uh, okay, let's go on to the recommendation letter. And uh, Daisy and Anibal, uh, you guys are more than welcome to answer some of the questions in the Q&A through chat uh, if they're relevant. And I'll, I'll just continue with the presentation. So who do I ask for a recommendation letter? So ideally for the recommendation letters, you wanna uh, ask faculty that can speak about your accomplishments, intellectual potential and motivation for study. So you want mentors who have seen you grown as a professional, as a person. They can speak about your potential to succeed in grad school and as a scientist. So you wanna have uh, research mentors, department chairs, faculty mentors, summer programmers, research mentor. These are just some people who can speak about it. I think um, I, I actually just had a conversation with pretty much one of the directors uh, involved in program admissions. And he pretty much told me what he looks for in application and specifically for the recommendation letter. And he says like, I prefer having a recommendation letter that can speak about the candidate's ability to be a good PhD scientist, what exactly did they do in that research project? Not that they worked in a lab for two years and they're a great scientist, uh, but more of uh, what was their role in the research project? Uh, apologies, I think I'm having some technical difficulties for a second. Let me just figure this out. Okay, great, I'm back. All right, so um, back to what I was getting at. Uh, the strong recommendation letter is whether that PI can speak about what exactly you did in that research project. The more detailed that you can be, that they can be in talking about the time you've put into your work, the better it works. Like for example, you don't want a PI, let's say you get a research uh, recommendation letter from a Nobel laureate and they write something like, oh, uh, Anibal worked in my lab for two years, he studied this, he did a good job, you guys should accept them. That's not a good letter because it tells you nothing about uh, what uh, Anibal has done in the two years working in a research lab. Rather, you wanna, it will be more of like, they have worked in my lab for two years studying the role of X, Y, and C. Um, they found uh, uh, or investigated this particular research project. They troubleshooted these things. They discovered X, Y, and C. Uh, in addition to that, speak about the scientific abilities or uh, what exactly is it about you that you can be successful in that PhD program. So there has to be more detail. And there are times where like, who, uh, how do I know? What if I don't have a, a research mentor that can write a strong letter? Maybe I only know them for half a semester. Or what if, um, what if they don't know exactly what I did because I was one in a lab of 20? Well, what, something that's a little more common when you proceed in your academic career is that professors expect you to write your own rec letter and then they sign off. So that's something that you could do. So for example, if you wanna ask someone for a recommendation letter, 
you tell them, look, uh, can I get a recommendation letter from you? I've written a summary of my research experience, what exactly my role in a research project was, how I was able to troubleshoot or navigate certain things in my experience, the results that I found, and uh, things that can talk about my scientific ability to do well in grad school. Because now you gave that PI a lot of material that they can use in a recommendation letter, and you made their job a whole lot easier. So that's another approach. If you think that your PI can write you uh, a good letter, or maybe he's, they're busy, you're giving them a lot of material to work with already. And that's something that's a little bit more common as you progress uh, throughout uh, academia. And then uh, some common pitfalls, I would say, uh, when it comes to recommendation letters uh, is you don't want professors who uh, do not know you well. You took one class, graduate student teaching assistants. I would say I, I, I early on, I made a mistake of asking one of the TAs for a recommendation letter for a summer program. I definitely did not get it. Uh, but that was because I was very new to the process of what, uh, what to expect when it comes to rec letters and letters from non-academic mentors. Once again, stick to research mentors, department chair, faculty mentors, uh, someone that can speak about your abilities. All right. Uh, I personally like requesting a recommendation letter at least two months in advance. I'm just going to be honest. A lot of professors leave it for the last minute, but they don't like it if you ask them last minute. So if it's due December 1st, do not ask them last two weeks in November because they're going to, in addition to their academic responsibilities, now they have to write a recommendation letter and they may not have enough time. But if you ask them earlier on, at least they can start uh, implementing what exactly they want to write in the recommendation letter. And you also give them time to receive a summary of your uh, key points that you want to include in the recommendation letter if you decide to do so. So you want to be succinct, direct, and respectful when contacting professors. Just get straight to the point in, uh, in the email. So email your letter writers uh, with, here's my CBO resume, my personal statement, information, uh, uh, to be included in the letter, list of programs that you're applying to, uh, the easier you make it for them, the better. So for example, in this case, uh, we have uh, Paula requesting a recommendation letter and they're saying like, look, they're applying to grad school. Can I write, can I get a strong rec letter? I'm applying to 10 programs. They require a reference letter to discuss X, Y, and C. I've worked in your lab X amount of years and I think a, a recommendation letter will really help me. Do you have the time to write me a letter? I can provide additional information. So that, that's actually a good point. Like when you email them, don't add your CV, personal statement and everything else you wanna include. You wanna wait for them to say yes, and then you send that information. Just because it seems a little bit too forward if like, hey, can you write me a rec letter? Here's everything I need from you. So it's like, first you wanna wait for them to say yes, I, uh, I will be willing to write you a rec letter. And obviously the deadline. I want to say, though, uh, the easier you make it for them, the better. So after they say yes, uh, that they can write you a rec letter in addition to including your resume and your personal statement. I like including a list, uh, an Excel sheet of all the programs that I'm applying to and the deadline. That way they are aware they're going to receive emails from these different universities in around one. And uh, definitely if they don't, uh, how do you say, uh, get back to you, you, you're welcome to send them a reminder email. All right, personal statement. So uh, let's talk about a personal statement. So a strong personal statement uh, focuses on a couple key objects. The first thing is background and motivation. Uh, how did you get interested in science? How did you get particularly interested in your research field? What did you learn from your research experiences? What build this interest? And what is it about you uh, in your research experience that makes you a really good candidate that's prepared for grad school. And lastly, what do you want to do with your PhD in the future? So you definitely want to address these points uh, in the personal statement. Uh, and remember, the objective of the personal statement uh, is grad school will open the, the path to future careers that require skills from uh, rigorous scientific training. So you want to make it very clear why exactly you want to go to grad school. It's going to be five to seven years so when you're applying to a PhD program in your personal statement, don't say, I want to apply to grad school because I think science is fun. 
uh, more of like, I want to apply to grad school because I want to be an academic professor in neuroscience, specifically Alzheimer's disease. And I want to build up research experience studying Alzheimer's and in vitro and in vivo models during my PhD. So I have a better understanding of how to tackle these things as an independent researcher in the future. So something along those lines. Okay. Uh, your, a good person statement also uh, talks about grad program qualities. So uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the personal statement as a key is the first paragraph is always an abstract about who you are as an applicant. And then the majority of the body is, tell me about your different research experiences, how you have grown, critical thinking skills. Maybe you were stuck in a problem and you troubleshooted and you solved it, what you learned. Um, and then lastly is why that grad school? So you want to talk about what is it about that PhD program or that apartment that appeals to you? Why do you want to get that PhD at that institution? Uh, so I mentioned faculty members whose research interests you and, and why it does. So for example, uh, let's say I wanted to go to Brown University for my PhD. I'm not going to say I want to go to Brown University because it's an Ivy League. Like, no, maybe that's true internally, but you want to say Brown University offers a whole bunch of different uh, PhD programs that have professors who have done research in virology. And specifically, I'm interested in studying this particular virus. Uh, and I see that there are five different professors in that university that have experience studying this particular virus. And I hope to gain the skills necessary to better understand this. So you ideally want to mention why exactly you want to go to that PhD program, whether it's the professors, whether it's the research being done there. You may even want to do the extra research and be like, maybe those universities have, let's say, you want to be a professor and you want to improve your mentoring, your teaching, your writing skills. Maybe that university has a center for teaching and learning and writing where you could develop these skills. And that's something you want to include in your personal statement, because not only did you do research in that department, but you did research on that university as a whole. So now they know like this person is applying to my university and is taking it very seriously because they had the time to look at all of these professors and what's available at, at university that's gonna complement their skills as a researcher. Uh, and when you mentioned faculty members, you ideally wanna mention uh, those that have an overall team. So for example, you, you don't wanna say, I wanna work with five professors. No, you wanna say, uh, let's say I'm interested in studying Alzheimer's disease. The first uh, professor, like I'm interested in studying Alzheimer's disease at Brown University. And particularly, I am interested in working with this professor because they take a mouse module approach to study uh, isolate amyloid beta. This other professor takes an in vitro approach to study how these uh, proteins aggregate. And this other professor takes a fruit approach of studying Alzheimer's and fruit flies. So, all of these different, uh, I want to apply to the school because I'm able to tackle this particular question from different model organisms or different systems. So it's like you have an overall team of why you're interested in tree professors rather than just saying a random names. A couple of things I will say, um, if you have, uh, how do you tackle some outstanding components in a personal statement? So there are different ways of uh, overcoming these things. So let's say, you have uh, bad grades in your undergraduate degree, but you have a lot of research experience. That research experience can at times compensate for those grades, just because let's say you got a 2.8 GPA, but maybe you have three or four years of research experience. That's gonna look a lot more uh, important rather than what their GPA was like. Uh, so you definitely wanna make sure that you uh, explain them in a positive manner. Uh, maybe you have a gap in research experience and maybe you don't have enough research because you come from a university that there are no research labs available. Uh, and if there are no research labs uh, available, how are you going to do research? So you want to include that in your personal statement. Look, look, despite the limited number of research opportunities where I'm at, I was able to find one research experience and I spent X amount of time over there. So you definitely want to include... Um, things like that. Uh, and lastly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, faculty members uh, who are writing your rec letter can support your narrative and development. So they, if you don't want to talk about this in your personal statement, they can talk about it as long as it's addressed. All right, so in terms of some common errors, 
You want to make sure that you proofread several times. Uh, you want to make sure if you're applying to 10 different schools that university and department program names are correct. Yes, you, you there might be at times you want to reuse your personal statement, but you want to change a few details. Uh, obviously, the professors, the program name to make sure they're correct. I'll say, for example, I think I was applying to Johns Hopkins University and I wrote Yale instead of Johns Hopkins and obviously I never got an invite. So you definitely want to make sure that you double check, triple check those statements before uploading it on the application portal. Uh, once again, your personal statement is not your resume. You want to include uh, things in your uh, personal statement that can convey your personality and passion. So for example, Let's say uh, I was talking about my undergraduate research experience. Oh, sorry, Daisy, if you go back a slide. Uh, I was talking about my undergraduate research experience. Uh, uh, and uh, not only was I able to do research in a research lab, but let's say two years of research. Uh, I talk about a research problem, what I learned from that research pro problem. But maybe I also had the opportunity to present at a national conference about my research. In that case, I can nicely tie that in because of my work spending X amount of years in the lab, I was able to present at X, Y, and C. And from that experience, I learned X, Y, and C. Uh, but the main thing I wanna say, and it's a key thing from, especially from program admissions directors, when you talk about your research experience, do not just list what you have done. Talk about how you have grown as a scientist and what you have learned, especially critical thinking and troubleshooting. If you spent months working on a problem and you finally solve that problem by whatever reason, you talk about that because that shows that you're able to think like a scientist and that you were able to, let's say, maybe you read the literature, maybe you collaborated with someone, maybe you talked to your peers. Then this is something that you really want to mention in your personal statement because it shows your capability of being an independent researcher. And lastly, maintain verbosity. You want to talk about very, you want to convey your personal statement very clearly and concisely. There are some professors who are look, who are assigned 20 applications. And if you're assigned 20 applications, and if you only have five to 10 minutes to read each application, you want to get straight to the point in your personal statements. I would say for the most part, they focus on the first and the last paragraph. And your research body, they try to focus on uh, your most important one. So I want to say that this is something uh, that you really want to make sure you have a really catching personal statement, introduction and ending. Uh, like I always say something along the lines of, uh, I am interested in a PhD program in biochemistry. I have built up five years of research experience in molecular biology and fruit flies, uh, developmental biology and C. elegans, and et cetera. And because of these skills that I have learned, this has made me a strong PhD applicant for this particular program. And uh, that way it's like, oh, okay, well, they have a lot of research experience and they've done X, Y, and C. Let's read about their particular scientific journey. Okay, and definitely don't include any items that are not relevant to the application. All right, uh, once again, do not make excuse, uh, excuses or focus on negative aspects. I understand, uh, that um, every once in a while, there are certain factors that you need to explain, whether it's GPA, gap years, uh, limited research experience. But the important thing is that you, your personal statement, you wanna talk about it in a positive manner. So as mentioned earlier, decide if there's something that needs to be explained, whether it's grades, talk about how you compensated for that. And despite all of that, how you're ready for grad school. Uh, how you overcame the obstacle. And once again, uh, the rec letter writer can really make a difference in this. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry, I think we're I think we're going a little bit backwards. Uh, yeah, okay, great. Uh, so let's uh, look at an example personal statement. So uh, an example personal statement, uh, here is just uh, an example of the introduction. You're introducing the field of interest that you're particularly interested in, what made you interested in that specific field, and uh, the contributions to that particular field. 
So in this case, uh, this candidate was interested in sensory perception, how they got interested in sensory perception. And well, obviously they're doing a PhD because they wanna to contribute to that particular field. Um, this is just one example. We have many, many other examples of personal statements in our writing center on our Scientific Latino webpage. So definitely check those out. Okay. And then uh, next slide. So this is the body. So for the most part, uh, this is gonna be very similar per research experience. Your first research experience you talk about during my, uh, I worked in this research lab for X amount of years at this university. I was particularly studying this particular component. This is what the goal of my research project was. This is the methods that I used to study uh, the particular research. This is what I found. And in this case, this kind of talks about troubleshooting a bit. This experience showed me that research is not straightforward since it involves many trial and errors. Maybe you could have expanded on that a little bit more, but then the experience that they learned from their work, even though the project failed, you were it was an opportunity to impact human health through basic research in your biology. And then you kind of repeat this for different research experiences. All right, and then the closing statement I would say is why that grad program? As we mentioned before, if you're applying to a PhD in neuroscience, you want to make sure that a university has a lot of professors who are doing neuroscience research uh, and uh, who are the faculty that are interested in. What exactly is it about a graduate program? So for example, uh, this particular candidate talked about how there are certain experiences at Rockefeller, such as science communication and media group and uh, uh, YSRR. And because of her experience in a similar group, she wants to take advantage of that. And lastly, her overall goal, she wants to be a professor. Uh, and with the training of Rockefeller, this is gonna really help her um, to, to advance in that career. Alrighty, now we reached the end. So I think we're gonna just stop sharing the screen and uh, we're pretty much gonna get ready to answer uh, as many questions as we can. So uh, thank you everyone for staying uh, with us towards the end. Happy to see we still have 54 people here. So uh, we're gonna address a couple of these things. So uh, yeah, I gotta, let's see, should I ask for a fee waiver before I contact the PI? and do all that, I access because I can't afford a fee waiver and I like to know how to be more efficient when applying. If uh, Daisy or Anuel can answer that. Oh, sorry, uh, Daisy and Anuel. You guys are muted, yeah. I think I I believe that you know um personally for me I just I I I knew that if I wanted to apply to a PhD program like I saw like I've already identified like my five PIs then I would just like go ahead and just ask um for a fee waiver and but um yeah because I think that when I already kind of establishing like the email like communication thread with like the director of graduate school admissions or the registrar right it's that's kind of like they kind of already expect like okay we're gonna see right like Daisy kind of um applying for the program but then I will say that um you know with the turnaround with the regards to the fee waivers they're usually quite quick um to be to be quite honest like in my in my experience like I have emailed like the um, director of you know grad admissions and I got like the code for the fee waiver. I, I gave them like my screenshots of my FAFSA, like my tax documents and everything. And I got a reply back within two days, normally within 24 hours. So I would say like, you know, um, it, it doesn't hurt as well. I think that it doesn't truly matter too much, but I think that, you know, it does kind of, you know, um, I think that they do kind of take it into account as well. Just like, okay, well, I know that this person asked. And so I'm going to kind of expect like see a person's name um, in the application pool. But that's just my opinion. Just maybe, um, you know, look into the, the programs, um, see if you really like want to apply to it. And then, yeah, like, uh, you know, alongside that, then if you like, oh yeah, I can, yeah. I'm leaning towards like, okay, yes, I'm applying. Like email the, Registrar at the missions and be like, okay, can I have a fee waiver? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Daisy. Then um, uh, we have one from Blessing. I noticed that many schools ask for a list of other grad programs someone is applying to. Do you have any idea why? Also, is it advisable to list all the schools, especially if you're applying to at least six schools? Uh, if Daisy or anybody wants to answer that. I can answer that. Um, and then Annabelle, you can also like chime in, add in. So normally it's kind of like, um, it's like a metric. Like I think like, you know, a lot of the programs like want to see, okay, like, like what, what's the type of like students that we're attracting. Right. And so it's just like, oh, like they, you know, they don't say this, but like after working with the, the recruitment uh, across all the tracks and all the PhD programs here at Yale, I kind of like understand where they're coming from. They're like, they're like okay, well, a lot of students are actually like going to, I don't know, like you may show like Harvard and like, what are they doing over there that we're not doing, you know? But also um, they ask because they're also optimizing, like, okay, what's like the highest probability that we're gonna, you know, have most of the students that we're accepting for interview will actually come to interview. So let's say like, Yale is having, you know, an interview at this date. And then Rockefeller is also having an interview in that, like that date. Right. And so they want to know like, oh, where are you applying? So like they have an idea of, all right, we don't want to have conflicting weekends. Right. And so to opt like, you know, in, increase the probability optimizing, you know, the chances of, all right, we want you. So we want to make sure that your schedule is free that weekend. Um, but yeah, generally they all like, you know, every single program already has an idea of like, okay, like what are some of the programs that they're kind of like, you know, um, competing with, so to speak. And so, yeah, it's literally just like for them to know, you know, where, where are you interviewing so that we don't have an interview on that, those dates. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, what kind of people can you ask to review your written materials for applications? Should it only be academics? I would say uh, try to have the majority of them academics. But uh, if you have some who are uh, in the field of humanities or English who are really proficient at writing essays, I suggest reaching out to them as well because they can help you even if uh, the science isn't, um, well, they're able to make sure that you're conveying your point very quite clearly. And this definitely helps as well. Uh, okay. I want to add on to that one like really quickly. So I actually typed in some of the answers to other questions. Like if people are asking, oh, like, is it bad if, you know, my PI like, you know, went into industry or what if you have a letter of recommendation from someone who's in industry, right? So like, I actually, personally, I actually asked, um, you know, a letter of rec from a mentor, like in a pharma summer internship. And so as long as that person can, you know, everything that, you know, Rob mentioned in the personal statement, you know, a section which is like, if someone can talk to you in the capacity of knowing you as like a really resilient scientist, independent, critically thinking, always like, you know, troubleshooting and like thinking ahead in that capacity, it could essentially be like pretty much like anyone, you know what I'm saying? So it doesn't really matter if it's like an academic. Yeah, ideally like PI is like an academic setting, but you know, like you know, you probably done an internship. You want to explore what's out there, right? In like biotech or like pharma. So like naturally, it's also pretty good. Like if you have, you know, someone from industry just to say like, hey, like Daisy's got the skill sets. She's ready to freaking do her thing in a PhD program, right? So all that stuff. So uh, with that being said, it's fine if it's not all of them from an academic institution. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have another one. Uh, are there differences between a statement of purpose and a Person, the personal statement. Um, they're quite used interchangeably uh, these days, but I will say the statement of purpose, that one you uh, discuss uh, a little bit less about your uh, what got you interested in science and more focused on the research. And similarly, so you have your personal statement, which statement of purpose, which is a little bit similar. Then you have your research statement, which is strictly about your research and nothing about you, uh, your interest in science. Uh, and then, uh, then you have your diversity statement. So I'm gonna answer that question that someone addressed. What exactly should I cover in a diversity statement? That's a great question. So in a diversity statement, uh, you could address it in these different ways. You can say uh, they pretty much, the prompt is something along the lines of, uh, 
what can you do to contribute to diversity and inclusion at our graduate school? Or how can you improve diversity and inclusion at our, uh, uh, our university? So obviously one of the uh, obvious uh, uh, ways uh, of addressing this is, okay, what is it about my experience that can contribute to diversity and inclusion in academia? So for example, uh, one of the ways of doing this is maybe you did a lot of science outreach in undergrad, and maybe you want to make sure that undergrads at a university that you're applying to, they have access to a network of scientists who can help them uh, navigate a PhD or a master's program. So in terms of tackling that, there are different ways. You could start a mentorship program at your university to help grad students or to help undergrad students. You can volunteer in a neighborhood area to improve science communication and bring science outreach aware to the area that you're applying to. Um, you can talk about uh, how to improve the pipeline of diversity and inclusion in that particular university. Maybe you could start, uh, how do you say, um, networking mentorship, uh, sorry, mentorship between different universities and the university that you're currently in. Uh, or maybe you could uh, informally pretty much mentor applicants after you get in, uh, applicants applying to grad school uh, with their applications. So uh, I would say uh, definitely uh, those are just some different ways of uh, including that, uh, addressing that diversity statement. You can also check their website. I'm pretty sure we have at least a couple examples. Okay, let's see what else. Uh, in the most research experience, it's not closely related to my field of interest, but my advisor could write a really strong rec letter. Would it be strong enough? Yes. Uh, it, the main thing is it doesn't have to be, if you have a research experience in neuroscience, you're applying to biochemistry programs. It doesn't matter if your advisor is not in biochemistry. What matters is how well can that advisor speak about your abilities uh, in, in to, to be successful and to be an independent graduate student. So you definitely, you should definitely ask uh, for that recommendation letter. Uh, okay, I got one for Anibal. If I have not yet decided which universities I'm going to apply to, should I take the TOEFL and add the universities after I have the results or is it advisable to have the list before taking it? Yeah, so yeah, just as I mentioned, once you take, if you do take the TOEFL before getting to applying to the specific universities, make sure you know at least four codes for four institutions so that on the day of the TOEFL, you can add those institutions and they won't charge you extra $20 per each institution. So yeah, I think the other, the other more important part about this is just uh, touching base with the program to just make sure that you do need the TOEFL and that maybe you, or if they take alternatives such as a duolingo test. So I didn't mention it because it's not broadly acceptable earlier, but uh, thanks for asking about it. Uh, thanks for asking about more details because the duolingo test is just as proficient and many universities are accepting it now. And it's only $50 versus the TOEFL, which is $180. Um, so before just deciding on taking the TOEFL, which is an economic investment, um, just make sure you check with the university if they can add also maybe take uh, another method of proficiency. But yes, um, I guess short answer, if you do take the TOEFL, make sure you know at least four universities once you get to the test day. Great, thank you, Anibal. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, uh, there, we have a question. I applied to PhD programs last year and I done, then I get in. My application materials have not improved significantly. Should I still reach out to the same professors, PIs I reached out to last year? Uh, yeah, they, I, okay. yeah. Um, this sounds very familiar. Um, it, I, it, it was hard really for me as well. I applied one year after the other, and so, really, um, I definitely had to alter my strategy. The only thing I did better, I think, than the previous year I applied to was really just go over statements a lot and write a lot. That's uh, that's uh, That was on my end. So really, um, you can take control of that portion. Just make sure you rewrite and rewrite things as much as you can. On a more practical note, if you can take advantage of any research experience that you have gone through through the last year, then really capitalize on that. 
and uh, just make sure to to really hone in on that during your statement. So yes, short answer is right and uh, about all your experiences because they're all valuable and just make sure you get more eyes on it. Okay, great. Um, all right, um, I think I'm just gonna answer one or two more questions before wrapping up. So if you have any, feel free to add them. Uh, what should I cover in the additional statements? One of the programs I'm applying to uh, ask for uh, cover a section about the research statement, one for motivation and goals and the additional statement. So uh, the additional statement, I would say there should be information uh, on what exactly they want you to discuss. Maybe there's a question that they want you to address uh, unless you mean additional information. Uh, every once in a while, some PhD programs, in addition to the personal statement, research, diversity statement, maybe some question prompts that they have, they say, is there any additional information that you want us to know? And in this case right here, this might be a, a, a good example to say, if uh, maybe you didn't have the best uh, GPA, or maybe you weren't able to get a recommendation letter from your current PI for whatever reason, this could be one place where you can talk about it briefly, just because this is kind of way like, is there anything that we need to know before we uh, assess your application as a whole? So you definitely want to take advantage of it if, you, if there's something that needs to. And if uh, if, if not, then if, I wouldn't worry about it. All right. I think that's it for, yeah. I think that's it for questions. Uh, I think we answered most of them already. Uh, okay, great. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, definitely, uh, we're going to upload this recording next week uh on our youtube channel definitely feel free to subscribe and check all of our previous webinars on the grad school application process personal statements and a whole bunch of other information feel free to give us a shout out on twitter if you want <laughs> and i just want to thank uh daisy and Anibal for taking the time to uh give this webinar we wish you the best with your grad school application cycle and remember just because you don't get in this year doesn't mean you won't get it in the future. You just want to keep trying and finding ways to improve your application. Okay, there have been people who have been applying three years and they have gotten in. And even if your GPA, let's say, I, I personally knew a student with a 2.6 GPA who got into one of the best programs in uh, for her field. This is because she increased her research experience. So just keep on trying uh, and definitely we wish you all the best. All right, see everybody. Thanks guys.